I think one of the warmest and most comforting words we can say is the word love. Just stop and think about it. Just saying that word, right? Love. And when you place that word at the end of two other words, it makes up this simple yet amazingly beautiful little sentence. I love you. And some of you just proved that that's a special sentence because you just kind of got a little warmth in you, a little smile on your face. And I have a few uh, love quotes for you this morning that I want us to take a look at. See what you think of these. Could put that first one up there. Everyone says you only fall in love once, but that's not true because every time I see you, I fall in love all over again. Isn't that nice? Guys, write that down. That's your next, <laughs> next card for your wife. It's a good one. I love that one. All right, how about the next one? Love doesn't make the world go around. Love is what makes the ride worthwhile. You like that one? I wrote that. No, I didn't write that. <laughs> All right, and enough with this uh, sappy sickness. All right, let's move on. You know that tingling feeling you get when you like someone? That's your common sense leaving your body. <laughs> I love that. Wow. That is so true, right? How about the next one? Next. The brain is the most outstanding organ. It works 24-7, 365 from birth until you fall in love. <laughs> And then the last one for you this morning. Love is spending the rest of your life with someone you want to kill and not doing it because you've missed them. <laughs> Can I hear an amen, ladies? <laughs> we love love. Is it fair to say? Um, we write about love. We sing about love. We develop whole stories around love. I mean, really, try to think of a movie that you've seen that doesn't have an element of love woven into the story. In fact, it could be that one of your favorite movies, ladies, is a story that is totally surrounding the topic of love. And someone might say, of course, love is the best thing ever. And you'd be in good company because listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, which we refer to many times as the love chapter. The very last verse says this, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. So scripture says that the greatest out of faith, hope, and love is love itself. And, and what's so interesting to me is that as much as we're enamored with this idea of love, we have a very difficult time defining what it is. I mean, really stop and think about it. It's a whole lot easier to talk about love than it is to know exactly what it is. It seems to me that if love is such a, 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 an intricate part of our lives and we reference it so much, and it's so sought after, it seems to me that it would be a good idea that we know what it's all about, right? And yet, I got a hunch that if I were to ask, individually ask you today to define love for me, that most of us in here would struggle. And you're not alone. I mean, just Google what is love, and you will be amazed at the articles that you'll see and the different definitions you'll see, and, and many of them don't even have the same elements. It's kind of like, wow, we can't even get on the same page of what love means. In our current series, we've been looking at the, this idea that God is best. He's good, and he's the source of all good. There is no good, we've said, beyond God. We say, sometimes we, we hear that saying, the, the buck stops here. Well, we could say about God, the good stops here. There is no good beyond God. He is as good as it gets. He is the best. He is the highest good, so he is the highest love. Because love is the highest good. So in order to know what love 
is, we've got to look at him. In order to know how to define this love, we've got to go to the source of love. And today as we close out this series on God being best, we're going to take a look at this idea of love and what scripture has to say is the greatest of these. And our goal is to, to try to better define what love is. I hope when you leave this morning, if someone stopped you as you walked out the door and said, what is love? You'd be able to give them a definition when you go out this morning. But I also want us to be able to learn how to love best. Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be the best lovers in the proper sense of the word that there are. So let's jump into it. First, I want to take a look at what I'm calling the priority or prioritizing love. And the first thing is this. We were created to love and need love. That's the way we have been made. Love is not something we evolved into. Love is something that is a part of our being. And if you put that on that first bullet point, we, we were created to love God and need God's love. Literally, humans are hardwired to love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. And we've been talking about the idea that as, as humans, according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we were created in the image of God. And so as image bearers, Part of the image of God that we bear is this ability to love. But the greatest love that we uh, have as far as the direction that it goes is the love for God and the need for God's love. Like God, we've been created to love. Unlike God, we've been created to need love. I love what C.S. Lewis says about this deep need that we have. Take a look at this. He said this, our whole being by its very nature is one vast need. Incomplete, preparatory, empty, yet cluttered, crying out for him, listen, who can untie things that are now knotted and tie up things that are still dangling loose. I love that. That, that we need God because we've got stuff tied up in our lives that we need untied and things that are untied that we need tied together. In other words, he's saying we need God from every angle possible. We were created to need the source of everything. We were created to love that source, and that's God. We were created for the best. Well, that should be our highest goal to love this God. Luke 14, 26 says this, if you want to be my disciple, Jesus said, you must by comparison hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. Would you look at that and let the the gravity of that sink in. Can you put that verse up? Look at this. Do I have it? Did I give it to you? Maybe I didn't give it to you. Let me read it to you again. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. He doesn't say friends. He doesn't say the person you work with. He takes the people that should probably be the closest ones in your life. Father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. He goes on to say, you need to pick up your cross and follow me. What was he saying? A cross was an instrument of death. He says, you need to be ready to give up that life that you already love. That's what he's saying. Do you, you understand the depth of what he's saying here? And we've talked about this before, but let me just paint the picture again. In the Oriental mindset, to choose one thing over another is to love what you choose and hate what you don't choose. We don't think that way. We think, well, I feel like taking this today, but I still like this over here. It's just today I feel like chocolate. I don't feel like vanilla. But if you stop and think about it from a very logical standpoint, 
if I'm only given the choice between two and I take one over the other, I have accepted one and rejected the other. Right? We don't like to think in those black and white terms, but that's the way they thought. And still do, by the way. That what I choose, I love, and what I reject, I hate. And Jesus said, listen, if, if you will not follow me because of father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, you've made your choice. You have chosen them over me. You can't be my disciple because there's only two choices here. Now, here's the thing. Later on, in a, in a different place, he talks about the idea that when you choose him, all those other things you get. It, it's what we've been talking about. Do you want the water flowing from the fountain or the fountain that has the source of the water? And that's what he's telling these folks. He says, look, don't get so fixated on all this when I am the source of all of that. And if you get me, you get that. And so the, 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 our priority should be we were made to love this God and need this God's love, and that should be our priority. We were made, if you put this down, to love people and need love from people. We see this right from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2, God makes the man. He makes all the animals first, then he makes the man, and he sees man by himself, and he makes this statement in verse 18 of chapter 2, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is fit or just right for him, or who fits him, or literally who corresponds to him. Listen, I've talked about this before. I like to bring this up in my premarital counseling. In, in uh, some translations, the word is translated helper, which is actually a good translation. I'm going to make a helper suitable to him. You don't need a helper unless you need help. The man needed help. God made a woman because the man needed some help. God said it's not good for him to be alone. He needs help. He needs somebody who can bring relationship to him his life. And so he makes woman who, by the way, for the most part, as we look at women, are, do much better at relationships than men do. I know it's true in my relationship with my wife. She is a much better relationship person than I am. I need her help most of the time. But in the very essence of what God is doing here, he's saying, listen, it's not good for the man, it's not good for anyone to be alone. That doesn't mean that everybody has to be married, but it does mean that everybody needs to be in relationship because we need to love people and we need the love of people. We were created that way. 1 John 2, 7 says this, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one you've had from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before. Listen, God doesn't give us commandments to meet some need that he has. God doesn't have any needs. He's God. God gives us commandments because sometimes we're not bright enough to know what we need. And so he commands us certain things for our good. We saw this earlier, a couple of weeks ago, Deuteronomy. God gave the commands for our good. And so when God says that we need to love others, it's not just because he wants to see us all sappy and gooey with each other. The goal is, look, I made you for relationship. This is what you were created for, and you're not doing very good at it. So I'm going to tell you what's good for you. You need to do this. You need to love each other. Because that's what we were created for. And then we were created to love ourselves. You say, oh, I don't know about that, man. Ephesians chapter 5, the last part of the chapter. God is, uh, Paul is giving uh, the example of what it looks like to be spirit-filled. If you look at Ephesians 5.18, there's the command there to be filled or controlled by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then he gives some examples of what that looks like. If you are controlled or, uh, or filled with the Holy Spirit, it's going to look a certain way. And he uses a basic relationship model, husbands and wives. 
he shows what a wife looked like who is spirit-filled. And then he describes what a husband looks like who's being controlled by the spirit. And he says this in verse 28. He says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. That's not a rebuke. What he's saying is, that's just what it is. You love yourself. You go, I don't know, I don't really. Okay, when you got up this morning, did you put clothes on? Did you stuff some food down your throat? When you leave today, will you go and do something that you might enjoy? Do you take basic care of yourself? Guess what? You love yourself. And we were created for that. We weren't, we, when someone doesn't take care of themselves, when someone harms themselves, what do we do? We go, whoa, that person needs help. Something is not right, right? Because there's a basic sense that we've been given this opportunity to love what God has given us in us. And when Paul says here, look, husbands, love your wives like you love your own bodies, he goes, basically, look, you take care of yourself, you take care of them like you take care of yourself. Now, of course, that gets twisted when we have something like, you know, emotional or mental uh, situations that make an individual unstable. Different story. He's talking about the norm here. And the norm is you, you do love yourself. You do take care of yourself. You do make sure you're fed. You do make sure that good things happen to you. Make sure that that is the very least that you do for your wife. Because, he says, when you love her like that, you're really loving yourself. And later on, he'll say, because the two are to become one. And that goes all the way back to Genesis. But the point here is there's a basic love that we have for ourselves. Romans 13, 9 through 10 says this, for the commandments say, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as what? Yourself. Well, what's he saying? He's saying, look, there's a basic truism that you and I love ourselves. We take care of ourselves. We'll make sure that good things happen to us. And he's saying that, in the very least, is the way that you should treat your neighbor. And so there's this sense that God has created us to love us. Now, of course that gets twisted, just like every other form of love. We're going to talk about that in a second. And of course we can love ourselves too much, and we know people like that. Don't look around, please. But we know that. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about the normal way that God created us. He created us to love him and to need his love, to love people and to need their love, and he created us to love ourselves. But our ability, number two, to love, like everything else, has been tainted by sin. And, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this because a couple weeks ago we spent some time just talking about the reality that sin messed up everything. It messed up the image of God, right? It messed up our ability to image God, to reflect God the way that we're supposed to. And that includes in this area of love. We cannot love the way we're supposed to. We don't love the things that we should, and we end up loving the things that we shouldn't. And that's because of sin. Sin has twisted everything. Everything good gets a twist because of our sin nature. John 2.15, 1 John 2.15 says this, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, when it talks about the world, it's not talking about the natural world. It's not talking about going outside and going, Man, what a beautiful day. Oh, I'm, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to love that. So I need to, no, that's not what it's talking about. When it's talking about the world, it's talking about the world system. And we know, based on scripture, that the world system is ruled right now by Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's taken all the good gifts that God's given us, he's put a twist on them, and he's put a twist in us by speaking into our ear, getting us to uh, magnify and glorify the gift rather than the giver. Overindulging in things that are good, like food, right? And what happens? We take a good gift that God's given us to enjoy and we overindulge 
and then we become gluttonous. Well, the food is not the problem. It's the sin that has tainted the right love that we should have for the one who gave us the good gift of food. And we could go on and on in that. I think you understand that. But, but the reality is all of this has been tainted. Our ability to love and how we love and who we love has been tainted because of sin. And we love the wrong things because we don't submit ourselves to the one who is love. So we could go on and on in that, but let's, let's give a little contrast of loves here before we move into some definitions. I want to give you a characteristic or some characteristics of worldly love. And I, and I think you'll, I hope you'll follow this, you'll get this. Maybe if you've never thought about it before, maybe it'll be kind of an aha moment for you where you go, oh, yeah, that's so true. I hope that's the case. But the world's love is confused in so many ways. And it's, be, it's confused because it's not based on a standard, Right? Uh, Pat talked about this a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about good and evil. And the only reason that we know what good is is if, it, if we know the standard that it's based on, right? The only way we know what love is if we know the standard love is based on. The world doesn't know the standard for the most part, which is God who is the source of love. And so because they don't know this God or they reject this God, they're confused in love. Makes sense, doesn't it? 1 John 4, 7 through 8 says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So you say, well, I know a whole lot of people that love. They must know God. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. It's love based on God. He's the one that defines love. It's not love based on our definition. And that's where we run into some struggles. Because we'll hear things like, well, love is always right. Right? Well, I would have to say, before I can agree with that statement, I need to know what you mean by love. What is your definition of love? I can't agree with love is always right. If we have two different definitions of love, and I'm saying yes, I may be agreeing with something that's not true. Now, we hear this often, too. We hear the idea that love is love. But is it? I mean, what does that mean? I, I, don't, I don't know that I can agree with that statement that love is love until I know what you mean by love. Because I may be agreeing with something that's not true. And by the way... Most of the time, when it's said the way that it is, I can't agree with it. Love isn't love. In that sense, it is. See, love, like so many other words and ideas in, uh, in our vocabulary today, have been redefined, retooled, twisted, changed. So you need to be careful that you don't just agree with something until you know what they mean by what they're saying. Because here's the first one. The world confuses like with love. Let me show you what I mean. When we like something or someone, it's because we get delight from them or joy. We get something from them or something, right? So I go, oh, uh, do, you, do you like pizza? And you go, no, yeah, I do, but I really love. Musa B. Oh, really? Yeah, I love it. I just love it. Do you, do you like so-and-so? No, I love them. They make me laugh. I feel so good when I'm with them. We're not really talking about love in that sense at that point. We're, we're talking about a very strong desire that maybe would be better def defined as like in our terminology. See, when I like something, I like it because of what it does for me. I like musubi because it tastes good. It makes me feel all, ooh, I love, I love, no, 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 I, uh, I really like, right? I say I love so-and-so, but maybe I really don't. Maybe I just like their presence. They're funny. They make me laugh. I certainly would die for them, but I like being around them, right? 
So like, I like things that delight me or bring me joy. But see, the world has twisted that. And so if something brings me delight or joy, I love it. And that can be a problem. Because if I don't have that definition right, if I don't understand that right, then I find myself pursuing things simply, merely, always for what it does for me. And that's me focused. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's not wrong to like things that bring joy and delight to you. That's not a wrong thing. But it can become a wrong thing if that's the only thing that you're pursuing. And we'll get there in just a minute. The world also confuses lust with love. Lust is when my desires are disordered. They're not in the right order. D desire in and of itself isn't wrong. Again, we should desire certain things. It's not a bad thing. But when that, that desire gets disordered, then it can become wrong. 1 John 2.15 again says, Do not love this world or the things it offers. For when you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers you a craving. And the word in the Greek literally is a lust. A lust for physical pleasure. A craving or lust for everything we see. And pride in our achievement and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they're from the world. And what is he saying? He's saying the good gifts that God gives can become disordered when that's all we pursue. And the good gifts are to point us to the gift giver. They are to point us back to this God who, man, God, you created these things. Put this in this particular food. And God, this you are amazing. And instead, we're focused on this. And this is all we want. And so we eat and we consume more and more. Or we buy and we buy more and more. Or we have relationship and we jump from one to the other because that's what we're focused on. And that becomes a lust. That becomes a self, I want to, uh, to, to eat, drink, be merry, all that I can. Because then it becomes about me. And the world has taken lust and put that idea in for this idea of love. The world also confuses feeling with love. To be human is to have feelings. It's OK to have feelings. Feelings aren't wrong. And love produces feelings, but feelings are not the same as love. Feelings can be deceiving. What's called the feelings of love many times, I think, are the feelings of infatuation. Oh, I just had these butterflies in my stomach, and I just felt tingly all over. And it's like, well, check. Maybe you're stepping on an electrical cord or something. <laughs> and we all know what that means, because most of us have been there. We've had those feelings. And, and the feeling isn't wrong. It's not wrong to have the butterflies. It's not wrong to feel the tingling feeling. But that's not love. That's infatuation, probably, where you see a beautiful person or a handsome person, and you go, oh, whoa. Or they say something that just you know, is so charming, and it's just. But have you, maybe you've had this experience. I don't know. You ever had the experience? When you've met somebody, you know, just maybe initially, just really short. Maybe you didn't even actually meet them, but you were in the same room with them. And you were just like having those tingly feelings and the butterflies and everything. You go, oh, my gosh, this person is amazing. I think I'm in love. And then somewhere down the road, you, you, you had an opportunity to actually like be in their presence, talk to them or see them functioning. And you realize they're a jerk. And all of a sudden, the tingly, fuzzy feelings weren't there anymore? What well, does that mean? You fell in love and out of love that quick? No, it means infa infatuation left quickly once you knew who the person was. But see, the world will tell you if you've had those feelings, man, go for it, because that's love. You're feeling love. You're feeling the love right now. If you don't believe me, listen to a lot of songs, because that's what it pretty much is, is, uh, is, is emphasizing, glorifying. The world also confuses, would you put this down, affirmation with love. We're being told that if you don't affirm someone, then you're not really loving them. In fact, many times we're told that if we don't affirm someone, we're actually a hater. And, and, and let me tell you what affirmation means in this sense. It's agreeing that what a person does, who they claim to be, 
and what they say is valid is all good. Let me say that again. To affirm someone in this sense is to say that, that what they do and what they claim to be and what they say is all good. Now, do you understand where that leads? If, I, if in order for me to love you, I have to affirm everything about you to say that everything about what you're doing, saying, is all good, that's a huge problem, right? But the world's telling us, no, 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 no. If you don't do that, you're a hater. Because only people who love affirm others in what they're doing. There's a difference between accepting someone right where they're at and affirming right where they're at. You understand that? To accept you right where you're at means that, look, I'm not making you change anything about you. I accept you for who you are right here, right now. That's what God does with us, doesn't he? He doesn't tell us to go clean ourselves up and then come back and see me later. He says, no, I'll take you just the way you are. But he loves us too much to leave us there. He doesn't affirm us in that. He accepts us in that. Affirmation says, oh, no, 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 you're all good just the way you are. Let's just keep you that way because everything's good. And the world says that's love. That's confusion. Now let's talk about the characteristics of biblical love. Biblical love is a choice. In Matthew 22, 36, a guy comes to Jesus and you know, you're familiar with the story. He says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Listen, if love isn't a choice, then that command is meaningless. He's commanding us to choose God. That's what he's saying. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The idea is, look, if he's the best, choose him. That's, again, in this mindset, to choose him above everything else is to, to love him. And Jesus is saying, choose him. Love is a choice. We decide that we are going to put this individual first in our life. Now, with that said, I, I, I want to be very careful to say that it's not just a matter of your inner life. Inner life. It's not, love is not just a matter, because then it gets real cold, doesn't it? Well, why did you marry your wife? Because I chose to marry her. Uh, try that on a card. <laughs> That's not going to work very good, right? Look, Philippians 2.12 maybe, maybe says it well. It says, work hard to show the result of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Now, now whose job is it in that first part? It's us, right? He says, you, so to speak, work hard to show the results of your salvation. How? Obeying God and have a deep reverence and fear for him. But look at this. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You see the beauty in that? You've got both going on. He says, look, you're, you need to be involved in this process, but also know it's God working in you to give you the desire to do what you need to be doing. There is a partnership going on here between our choice, God, I choose you, and God saying, great, I'm going to empower you to keep choosing me. That's what's going on. So love is a choice. We can choose love. See, the world says it's not a choice, man. You fall into love, right? Why did you marry that person? I just, I just got these feelings, and I just fell. It, was, it just came out of the blue. I don't know what hit me. It's this mystical, magical thing that we have zero control over, and we just have to follow our heart, right? It's not only a choice. Would you put this down as an action? Romans 5.8 says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still, still sending. See the action in there? God showed, God sent, Christ died. Love is active. It's action-oriented toward another Toward another. John 3.16, we all love that verse. Why do we love it? Because it speaks to us, right? For God so loved the world that he felt butterflies and fuzzy feelings and 
Is that what it says? For God so loved the world that he, ooh, that sounds like action to me. And then it goes on and tells us what the action was. Gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We love that because it reminds us I can't, he did. Love is active, it's action. Scripture also tells us that love is expressed with emotion. When Jesus, in verse 36 of Matthew 9, when Jesus sees a crowd, it says he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What is compassion? Compassion is a, is a, is a desire to meet a need that you see. Jesus has this compassion. These people are confused and they're helpless. He feels emotion. He feels compassion. It's a type of form of love. John 11, we've got Jesus at the funeral of his good friend Lazarus, and we read that shortest verse in the Bible, right? Jesus what? Wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. They equated the tears with Jesus' love. It's not wrong to be emotive or have emotions when you love, but the emotions in and of themselves aren't love. They're a byproduct of the love that we should have. And then lastly, it's focused in purpose. Love is willful, it's active, it's a desire. Here it is, for the best of another. Love desires the best for the one loved. That's why we can't love pizza. <laughs> I don't love pizza. Pizza does it all for me. I do nothing for the pizza. We love people. And we truly biblically love people when we desire best for them. That's what love is all about. It's a desire for best. Um, it, it, 1 Corinthians 10.31, we've looked at this before. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Why? Because he's the best, right? So, if my desire is for best for an individual, what should I always want for the people I say I love? Which is God. I want, I want best for, that's why As I, as I prayed today, sharing with you how my mom sat down with me at a table when I was a little boy, opened up a Bible, showed me John 3.16, and shared with me the truth of the gospel. And I understood it. Nobody had to tell me I was a bad little boy. I knew the stuff I had done. And in the process of that, telling me about the great love that this God had for me and sent Jesus to die on the cross for me, why would she do that? Because she wanted her son to have best and that should be our desire for our children, our spouses, the people around us. I want you to have best. I can't affirm you in something that's not true. Well, you know, they have their own religion. Okay. What does that mean? You're okay with that? If what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me, that's either true or it's not. And if it's not, then see you later. Find another way, I guess. But he said, I'm exclusively the way. If somebody's not following that, they will not get to the best. And we can't be okay with that. Because if I truly love you, I want best for you. So I can't say, well, you know, they have their own religion. I can say, yeah, they're following another way. And I really lovingly want to get them to the right way. Because God's way, remember what we said, is always the best way. There's no alternative. There's no second way. Well, they, they don't believe exactly like we do. Well, what is it that they're believing? Because if they're not believing Jesus, there's no other way. And if we say we love them, do you see how this works? If someone is in a lifestyle that they shouldn't be, and we don't acknowledge that that is destructive to their lives, into the lives of the people they're involved in because somehow we don't 
want to break a relationship with them because then we're not going to have an influence on them. Boy, that sounds pretty me-centered. It doesn't sound like I'm loving them to the best. Look, I love you, and because I love you, i got to tell you, what you're doing, what you're involved in, this is not best. And I remember many years ago now, I don't know, I think it's 15 plus years ago, right out front of these steps right here, talking to a woman who was just broken about a relationship she had been in for 16 years. She was living with a man. And she knew, based on some things that we'd been talking about, that it, that it wasn't what God wanted. And you know, I didn't beat her over the head and tell her she was a sinner going to hell. That's not what she needed to hear. What she needed to hear is what I told her. Listen. God has best for you, and this isn't it. God's best way is a committed, lifelong relationship in love. And God wants best for you. See, we get this idea that God's out there and he's real. Well, you guys are so, I can't wait to, it's not God. God says, no, look, I am best. I designed you, I made you, I made relationships. I want this for you because this is best for you. And when we really believe that, we want that for other people too. Randy, should I, you know, I, I, so-and-so and my family is involved in this, or in the, should I say anything about it? I, I don't know. How much do you love them? Look, I know this isn't easy, especially in the day and age that we live in. But folks, I don't know what else to do with it. I've had to say some very hard things to people, and not, not in a cruel or unloving way, but I've had to say some very hard, this is not God's best. And, and, and because of it, you are headed to destruction. Wow, that doesn't sound very fun. It's not. But let me tell you something, it's loving. You would do the same in a different situation. If your child was about to stick their hand in an open flame, you wouldn't say, well, you know, I just need to affirm them where they're at. No! You would step in and you would pull them away and you'd say, no, that is not flame bad for your hand. It's not good. This is not best. It's going to cause some real big problems. And we would do that in so many circumstances, but we're being told today in so many other circumstances, oh, no, 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 that... You can't do that. That's not loving. You can't tell him that. It's like, wait a minute. But that's what God says. God says this is his best. This is what brings flourishing in life. I want you to flourish. I want you to have joy. I don't want you to have some temporary happiness that's going to be fleeting and gone. And I don't want you to just have joy in this life. My desire for you is to have joy for eternity. Do we really want that? That's love. That's what scripture says love is. Love is desiring best, ultimate best for the people that we say we love. Now, very quickly, because I've gone way long here, but very quickly as we finish this out, Ephesians 5, 1 says this, imitate God. Ooh, there's that reflect God thing that we were talking about, reflect the best we talked about last week. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you're his dear, dear children. Listen, live a life filled with love. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Very quickly, let me give you three ways to love best. Here's number one. To love best, I have to love the best. Now, I'm not double speaking, because if you notice, best is capitalized at the end. To love best, I've got to love the best. In order for me to love, look, what did Paul just say in Ephesians? I need to be an imitator of God, and I need to follow Christ in the way that I love. The only way I can do that, if I know him. See, we're running around taking our cues from the world. And let me tell you something. If you do that, you will miss love. You cannot love the way you need to love unless you know the source of love. Doesn't that make sense? So in order for me to be the best lover that I can, I need to know the best. You want to be a great husband? Fall in love with Jesus. 
You want to be an amazing wife who loves her husband? Fall in love with Jesus first. You want to be an incredible employer, employee? Man, love Jesus. You go, wow, I don't know if it's that easy. Try it. Because that's exactly what Jesus was saying. When he looks at a guy and he says, look, sell everything you have, give to the poor and come follow me. What's he saying? Choose me and guess what? All this other stuff will make sense to you. All this other stuff's going to fall in line. Fall in love with Jesus. We're so fixated on telling people what to do and not to do, we forget to tell them, just love Jesus. If I love Jesus, I don't have to run around telling you what to do and not do. He's going to tell you. That's why it's called a relationship. Man, I'd love to park there for a while. Can't. Got to keep moving. Number two, to love best, I have to desire the best for others. And that's what we just talked about. Listen, I want you to analyze how you say you've been loving. Does your love sound like that? Does your love, do you truly want best for others? Now, then you have to ask yourself what you're measuring best with. So because again, just like love, if we're not careful, somebody throws out these nice sayings about love, but if we don't know how they're defining love, we might not be on the same page. Same with this. That's why we started with the best. That's our source. So in order for me to, to be able to say this, that I need to desire best, what I'm saying is I'm desiring God in his way because he's best, his ways are always best, and that's what I want for them. Listen, stop and think about how that would change your parenting. Think about it. We heard a testimony just a few weeks ago from David and Marissa, and let me tell you something. That situation, and they didn't bring out a whole lot of this, for Danny and Cheryl, they had to make some tough love decisions. They wanted best for their daughter. And in order for them to stay strong and desire that best, that meant watching their daughter leave for a while. You don't think that's hard? Talk to them about it. They'll tell you the heartbreak that was. It would have been so much easier to say, no, we're just going to affirm everything you're doing and everything you're saying. We're just going to affirm all that. That's not love. That's convenience. Love says, no, I want the best for you. I can't affirm you in this. I, 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 I love you, and because I love you and I want best for you, I cannot affirm you. But see, I have to know the best in order for me to be able to do that type of love. Number three, to love best, I have to desire the best for my enemies. See, this is super easy when we're talking about husbands and wives and children and people we work with. It gets really tough when we start talking about people that don't like us, and maybe we don't like them. Matthew 5.44 says this, but I say, Jesus says, I love your enemies. What? What's that mean, Jesus? That means want best for them. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, listen, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. What's that mean? Well, that goes back to Ephesians 5. Imitate God. You'll look like God, is what he's saying. You'll reflect God. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. What's he saying? Listen, God sheds grace on everyone, no matter whether they're his children or not, and you need to be that kind of a person. When we're dealing with these issues, it's not about anger and and. Uh, um, vitriol and anything else that we see out there in our society today by people who call themselves Christians, that is not God's love. God's love says, I, I want best for you. In tears many times. And in heartache and struggle. It doesn't mean that we're yelling and screaming and expecting, expecting unbelievers to act like believers. How ridiculous is that? How, why do we expect the unrighteous to act righteous? That's just nonsense. We should expect the righteous to act righteous. We should warn the unrighteous that God has better for you. No, no, no. God has best for you. And this isn't it. And we want to point you in the right direction because this God is amazing. And when you need him, man, 
Just like the song this morning, if you just touch the fringe of his garment, all I'm telling you is taste. Just taste and see. It's really good. See, it's, a, it's approach, folks. And sometimes it's our enemies, man. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge but didn't love others, I would be nothing. What's he saying? It's, it's, it's amazing what he's saying. He's saying if I had some kind of, uh, of, of, of scoop on God's secret plan and, and how he does everything, and I have all this knowledge about the way God works and the way God is and how amazing uh, his transcendence is and all these things we wish we knew we had the answers to. If I had all those answers and I had all that knowledge but I wasn't a person of love, big deal. That's what he's saying. Listen, we are living in a day and age where we are seeing a, a immense evil around us. Know who the real enemy is. It's not the faces that you see. It's the spirits behind the faces. And God has called us to love people. What does that mean? It doesn't mean we affirm what they're doing and what they're saying. It means we try to point them to the best. Don't get so hung up on what they're doing to miss, what, to, to miss the idea of what they're missing. They're missing Jesus. They may clean up. You may, you may be so strong and so uh, uh, convincing in your argument about the bad that they're doing that they clean themselves up and that they don't have Jesus. Who cares? They may have a decent life now, but they have no eternity. We don't want them to just clean up. We want them to get to God, who's the best. I, 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 I wish I had more time because I want you to understand if you and I really get this idea of love, it absolutely transforms the way we deal with everything, literally everything. The way I deal with people, the way I deal with issues, the way I understand. When I understand that love is about wanting best for those love, I just, if you'll get that, and if you'll just think about that, think about that. In your time with the Lord this week, God, we talked about this. Show me more on this. I want to understand this better. Because, listen, let me tell you something. When you understand this, it changes the way you deal with so much, and especially where we're at in the world today. The greatest love is when God said, I want you to have me, and you can't get me unless I come to you. John 3.16. God so loved the world, wanted best for the world, wanted him for us that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but get the best. Because you say, wait a minute, it says everlasting life. Yeah, but we get everlasting life defined as God himself, Jesus himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we could have the best. Man, what a great example. Amen? Yeah. Lord, we come before you this morning. God, there's so much here. It's so, so important for us to understand your love and the way that you want us to love. And I know that there's so much more that could be said. But God, I just pray that you would take this word. We'd ask, Holy Spirit, that you, you give us a very real sense of your presence. And so, Lord, I, now I come and I ask, Holy Spirit, that you help us to think deeper and richer on this idea, this truth, that love is when we want best, ultimate best, highest good for others. Lord, I pray that, that, that we would chew on this idea this week. And as we do, God, that we would realize how amazing it is because that's exactly what you've done for us. We're so blessed because you're so good. And I pray that you'd help us to, to reflect this kind of love. May we not be coerced into to buying into the world's love because it just is so much, uh, sells so much short your amazing love. God, I thank you for these folks. I thank you, Lord, for the time that we've had to talk about you the very best. 
pray that it wouldn't soon leave us as we step out of this series into something else, Lord. May it just keep coming back. Lord, you just keep being reminded because this is absolutely where you want us to be. We thank you and we praise you in your name.